claim your place, speak your mind, influence the outcome. Welcome to today's presentation on how public participation can help predict outcomes. A quick agenda for the presentation today, we will uh, begin with a quick overview of what market research is. Uh, we'll then dive into a more explicit exploration of, of what online polling is in the face of uh, the internet and changing dynamics of, of technology. From there, we'll get into a case study from PlaySpeak on the transportation vote, a, a plebiscite that was conducted by uh, the citizens of British Columbia. And then compare and contrast polling with public participation. We'll then have a, a recap and a review of both technologies and how things might have turned out if uh, public participation was leveraged uh, to, to a greater advantage. And then uh, we'll also recap with different ways that PlaySpeak can help to improve your results and uh, conclusions from there. Okay, so what is public opinion research? Well, public opinion research is comprised of two distinct but related products, market research and public affairs research. Research companies perform surveys or interviews to assess public opinion. When they focus on products, services, or habits, that's market research. When they focus on policy, ideology, or voting intentions, such as polling, then that's public affairs research. Corporations use market research to sell products or services. And politicians, policymakers, such as planners and agencies, want to monitor public opinion so they can respond to sentiment. So how is public opinion research performed? Well, information is collected using either uh, focus groups on a small scale, uh, or on a large scale, information is collected using surveys. Focus groups are moderated and recorded in-person discussions between participants selected to represent a target group. And generally, they are very expensive. They don't have sufficient sample sizes to generate real quantitative statistics. In other words, how many, how often, and so on. But they do provide lots of qualitative data. So uh, how do you feel? What do you think? So a lot of open-ended questions. Personal interviews have similar strengths and weaknesses as a research method. And to generate large sample data, surveys are usually, are usually required. Surveys need to be standardized so that everyone gets the exact same experience answering the questions. So what makes a good survey? Well, when it comes to surveys, the larger the sample, the more precision is permitted in the answer. For example, a survey of 1,000 people can yield a result with uh, an error margin of about 3%, whereas a 2,000-person survey can yield a result with an error margin of, say, 1.5%. The larger the sample, the smaller the margin of error, but at some point the margin of error is negligible. You don't get more value by running a big survey, or a bigger survey. And so now we're going to get into uh, a few other definitions. Prefer, previously, we talked about uh, precision, and right now we're going to get into accuracy. So the sample size, per se, has no connection with representativeness or with the accuracy of results. The bigger the sample size, the more precise the estimate, but the more representative the sample, the more accurate the estimate. As an example, if I went to Manhattan and I surveyed all the people of the city, I would have a very representative uh, uh, result of the survey of, of people's opinions and sentiments and stuff like that. But if I just went to Harlem, I'll still have something that, that has a lot of precision to it, but it only really applies to the citizens of uh, Harlem. It, it may not necessarily be representative of all the people in Manhattan. And so uh, precision and accuracy go hand in hand. So typically there are four methods for administering a survey. And in decreasing order of cost and reliability, they are in-person interviews, phone interviews, mail-outs, 
and then online. And so this is an interesting statistic uh, graphic uh, from uh, market research uh, provider. They surveyed all the providers of market research and this is the first year where online has been unanimously selected as a method to conduct survey research. Interestingly, telephone and mail are have decreased considerably over previous years. So we're seeing a shift in the way market research is being conducted and uh, conventional methods are being, uh, well, downplayed. Even more uh, important and, and interesting is that uh, Angus Reid has been quoted in Huffington Post as saying online polls are better than phone surveys in almost every way. Uh, his, he's been quoted as saying, based on his conversations with colleagues in the industry, rejection and non-completion on phone uh, telephone polls run to the 95% range. So this means that of the 10 people polling from my contact, more than nine aren't inclined to do the survey. What's left is a questionable mix of available respondents who don't often uh, properly reflect the diversity in the demogra demographic differences of society. Now this statement is even further supported by published research on telephone polling contact rates have dropped by nearly 30 percent and cooperation has fell correspondingly. Pew reported that its contact rate, the percentage of households in which an adult was reached at all, had fallen to just 62 percent in 2012, down from 90 percent in 1997. Of those successfully contacted, the cooperation rate, in other words, the percentage of contacts with an adult that yielded an interview was only 14%, down from 43% 15 years earlier. So this means that Pew's overall response rate, the rate of completed interviews to the number of phone numbers dialed, was just 9%. And, and so in simpler terms, in 97, a pollster could get a survey completed in one out of, uh, out of every two answered calls or connects. Today, that number is around one in six answered calls or connects. And so it's harder to get connects and it's more difficult to keep people on the phone. So why the sudden fall off? Well, perhaps there's a correlation between the number of people that actually still have landlines in the home. Is there any coincidence that the number in this survey indicates about 32% of adults do not have a landline at home, while the previous survey in the, in the previous slide shows that pollsters are achieving connect rates that are 30% lower? Regardless of the coincidence, the fact is that internet accessibility is higher than landline telephone installations. And this is a trend that is uh, continuing. So telecom operators are seeing customers abandon landlines at a rate of about 700,000 people, subscribers per month. Some analysts now estimate that 25% of households in America rely entirely on mobile phones, a share that could double within the next three years. Similarly, North American internet pen penetration is reaching an estimated 70% with most metropolitan areas well into the 80% range. And in Canada, those numbers are closer to 96 to 98% in most metropolitan areas. So online polls can be more accurate because people are more candid when responding to a computer and not a live voice in many cases. After all, a computer is non-judgmental. There is some evidence that indicates the difference can represent just a small margin of error of only a percent or two, but it could also mean a very significant point spread of 20% or more. This could be because when people are on the phone, they may just be inclined to complete the survey without much thought to the result. They just want to get off the phone. Whereas if a person is online and completing a survey, they may be more inclined to have uh, set aside the time to give each question a degree of deeper thought and consideration. 
but then just perhaps another reason why people don't won't cooperate with telephone pollsters is trust people don't trust a stranger on the phone as much as they trust a computer <laughs> it would appear that we are transitioning to a society that trusts machines more than people and in order of importance people want more control over who can access information on them are reluctant to share information they fear surveillance of their private conversations they want more control over who can collect information on them and it, most interestingly they want to be left alone at home similarly individual confidence in information gatherers is low and decreases depending on who does the asking people appear to trust their credit card companies the government and telcos but marginally marginally but beyond that it all mostly goes downhill when it comes to anything uh, about personal information a significant increase in the perception of security was observed with geo authentication so users it was it was identified that users felt more secure uh, when they felt more secure they were more inclined to potentially be more engaged with the application presumably because they felt that their data was safe and so geo authentication therefore could be justification to improve security but also improve uptake because people trust the application more and so when we talk about trust and we talk about geo authentication this is where PlaySpeak enters the uh, the picture PlaySpeak does geo verification better than anybody else but what's more is that we deliver a rock-solid commitment to privacy to everyone participants that can trust the uh, proponent with their personal information are more likely to be more open and honest with their answers answers that are honest can be relied upon for better policy and decision making we authenticate individuals based on their address but like a census we do not collect specific information on the individual that sort of data collection is up to the proponent to capture and convince the participant to surrender and uh, convince them in the value of surrendering that inf surrendering that information so one of the reasons why you would want to use uh, polling over or sorry public participation over polling well for the first part it facilitates privacy and geo authentication with our geo authentication tools and our commitment to privacy we are a broker of trust in engagements we contend that this is more valuable than having a huge panel of paid survey takers because when people get paid for their opinion they just might be providing an opinion in the hopes that they are selected for yet another paid opinion or paid panel PlaySpeak has been developed with certain objectives in mind and central among these objectives are participant privacy protection from direct marketing and the creation of an open and accessible process that accepts all members of, of a community in some ways these goals are at odds with polling and statistical best practices a, a, a consultation is significantly diff different from a, a research survey for example the more personal information that's collected in a survey the better the survey is from a research perspective but PlaySpeak on the other hand is designed with privacy as a central objective meaning that demographic data will have to be collected separately for each uh, uh, instance another difference between consultation and research polling is that a con in a consultation self-selection is a strength the most engaged and informed members of the community should be more involved whereas in a research context any kind of sampling bias invalidates the results at least insofar as they reflect the general population so what are the uh, the important attributes of what market research buyers and suppliers look for well everybody wants quality of data everybody wants the quality of, of uh, insight they want speed of delivery they want to do it at, at a, as cost effectively as possible 
and there's also reputation. So all these areas are in fact addressed by PlaySpeak's approach to collecting feedback from participants. And so we're going to explore how all these factors are satisfied in the following case study. All right, so here's a case study, the transportation vote with uh, PlaySpeak. So a quick backdrop for the out-of-town folks. The province of British Columbia, in connection with the electoral agency, Elections BC, uh, held a vote on what was officially termed a transportation and transit plebiscite. Citizens in 23 municipal areas were asked to consider a half percent sales tax increase to help pay for transportation infrastructure improvements. After all the ballots were counted, the turnout uh, for registered voters was 48.64%. The vote was a non-binding plebiscite proposed by the provincial government and conducted via mail-in ballot. Now, PlaySpeak ran a public consultation in parallel with a local news radio station, uh, News 1130. We'll review the results in the slides that follow. Okay, so at first glance, the site offers a dashboard with some quick statistics about the reach and the participation. So the first number, the 5656, tells us the unique views to the page. 5,656 people came to see the topic and learn more about the subject matter of the transportation vote. This number, in the context and in comparison with polling activity, would represent the contact rate. Now this is followed by the number of connected participants, which is 900 at the bottom, and represents nearly a cooperation over a rate of about 16%. Polling is closed with numbers just shy of 14%, but where things get interesting is the number of comments at 980. This is because this is not a poll, but a public participation exercise with two-way dialogue occurring on the site, but more about that in a moment. So the consultation, the consultation coincided with a media plan launch uh, initiated by News 1130 Radio. Most traffic would have uh, come to the page in one of three ways. Citizens either learned about the consultation by listening to the radio on News uh, uh, 1130, News AM 1130. Uh, they may have read about the consultation on any one of several popular social media channels, including Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or through blog posts on uh, PlaySpeak or News 1130 website. Uh, existing users of PlaySpeak may also have been notified uh, because when they signed up, they may have indicated in their profile they wanted to receive notification on topics that interest them and were notified via email. And so this last piece where there were citizens, people being notified via email from PlaySpeak, this is one of the other reasons why you would want to use PlaySpeak. It's the PlaySpeak community. Everything a panel can do, PlaySpeak can do, and more. Most polling companies keep a roster of panel participants available for a variety of uses. Recall the earlier slide about market research versus public opinion. Uh, these people are often vigorously solicited for their views on shampoo and voting intention, but PlaySpeak participants are purely tied to civic duty and community. We maintain that this improves focus and the quality of responses. And we'll also frequently speak to category knowledge as well because citizens know their neighborhoods better than anyone else. Moving forward, when the campaign was initially launched, indicated by the blue line in the center of the graph, PlaySpeak experienced a proportionate spike in traffic to the topic site. Then, throughout the campaign period, a number of spikes in traffic were witnessed, which corresponded to either media campaigns initiated by News 1130 or some social media buzz that drove visitors to the topic page. As the campaign gained momentum, we started to witness some interesting dynamics among the discussion group on the topic. Notably, there was spatial variation of responses by municipality week over week. This is indicated by the green dots representing uh, people in the various communities who connected up to the topic to discuss the transportation vote and how it might affect them in their neighborhood. 
More importantly, we saw people that were behaving like citizens debate on the site was authentic, civil, and respectful. What was even more remarkable was the lack of fake personalities that attempted to game the system. We found that when people were asked to provide their address with a full disclaimer and emphasis respecting their privacy, people were just more neighborly to one another. When the results came in, PlaySpeak was only three one hundredths of a percent away from the official ballot count published by Elections British Columbia. The official vote result was 61.68% against, and PlaySpeak's participation predicted an overall 61.65% against. Was this just luck, or was there something bigger happening? Well, comparing the vote results against a number of popular pollsters, everyone seemed reasonably close. Admittedly, the polls did not reflect the ballot exactly the same, and there was some flexibility or ambiguity that allowed participants to be undecided in a number of the other polls. The not sure outcomes were not included in the comparison polling. And while they could have swung the vote on either side a fair bit in terms of accuracy, nothing was substantial enough to yield a change in the outcome. In other words, um, even if we added the 13% undecided to the yes side, the outcome still would have been a no. Now, PlaySpeak's numbers were modestly different from the official ballot count, with higher support in Vancouver, New Westminster, and the District of North Vancouver. A number of factors might explain these variations, including things like sample size or simple panel bias, and we'll talk about bias in a couple of slides. Inevitably, once the sample size gets big enough, things like outliers and errors are diluted and almost unnoticeable. For example, PlaySpeak did not geospatially segment Tawasin, the Tawasin First Nation, and PlaySpeak did not have appreciable participation from some of the smaller villages. Instead, at the time of the vote, PlaySpeak had higher concentrations of citizens in other areas of the province, and the participation of one community helped to average out the lack of participation from another. But what about sentiment? Why were people going to vote yes or no? Well, not so ironically, the reasons people gave in the discussion forums were about the same as the reasons provided to the pollsters, with one key difference. The pollsters asked people why they were voting a certain way and provided them with a variety of options to choose from. In PlaySpeak, participants were just asked why and permitted to discuss their views amongst themselves. So, while a pollster might claim category knowledge is important, the overall results also suggest that those participating are the subject matter experts. As such, there are probably a finite number of potential answers for any kind of question, and the masses will self-organize, whether knowingly or unknowingly. In this case, the results were remarkably similar. Place speaks yes participants rated in order of preference, Public transit needs improvement. Traffic congestion will get worse. Environmental concerns were uh, third on the list. If we don't do it now, it will cost more later. And then Vancouver's future needs. So this compared relatively similarly to what the polls were running. But then what about the reasons for voting no in the transportation club site. The no side seems equally passionate uh, and shared the same values as the pollster panels. They were skeptical, there was resentment, confusion, doubt, all emotions seemed to run quite high in the play speak discussion forums. These results almost mirrored the results of the pollsters. And for play speak, order of sentiment was, TransLink cannot be trusted, I don't want a tax increase, uh, the proposed projects don't benefit my area, 
there's no benefit to me, and I don't trust the mirrors. Well, what's the difference? Good question. When it comes to polling, we've already heard that online has overtaken offline, uh, and it's more reliable in terms of data collection. Online is certainly more affordable, or can be once the panels are established. And an online poll can be completed in a relatively short period of time. A well-managed online campaign could hit literally millions of people with the same kind of efficacy as a telephone campaign. Even if an IVR platform, an interactive voice response or robocall was deployed, it would still either cost more or take more time to complete. And many companies offering polling services charge a base price and then augment their services with a variety of add-on modules and upsell the client on things like analytics, access to panels, and so on, which PlaySpeak does not do. But then there is the idea of bias, and many would argue that bias might exist within PlaySpeak, rendering it fundamentally at odds with getting representative results. But we maintain that uh, that's perfectly acceptable. Some researchers might criticize PlaySpeak as a research tool, that it suffers from a self-selected nature of a user base. The so-called self-selection would be people who are active members of a community and who are civic-minded. To them, we simply say that's a sampling bias that we are content to live with. It is certainly better than, say, a pool of paid participants who only volunteer their time when there's the promise of cash at the end of the question period. Clearly, this case study provides some evidence that the quality of data collection within PlaySpeak is within acceptable quality standards, at least within terms of representativeness and survey readiness. And recall the earlier slide, we talked about precision and accuracy. In this consultation, the user base was large enough to provide precision and because the users were spread out across the entire voting region, we had exceptional accuracy to three one hundredths of a percent in aggregate. Well, first things first, in the context of public participation, you would want to have bias. Bias means you have citizens that are engaged with the topic. A poll doesn't generally provide you with background information before it asks you a question. It just wants to get a snapshot in time public position or sentiment. And sometimes there's nothing wrong with non-representative polling. A representative sample is only needed to generate results that reflect the general population, but what if a political party or other agency wants to know about the opinions of the most engaged citizens, like uh, those who are likely to vote, for example? It's not illegal to administer non-representative samples. PlaySpeak community might prove to be exactly the kind of sample that policymakers are interested in hearing from. Public participation, however, is not the same as a public opinion poll. And so, some quick definitions. Uh, polls represent raw information that fails to take into consideration the processing of complex information that's necessary to come to what is referred to as a public judgment or an informed choice. Citizen engagement provides forms for citizens to process complex information so that they can come to a deeper understanding of a situation and thus become capable of making a well-founded choice. On the other hand, how is this different from negotiations with stakeholder groups? Well, stakeholder representatives often come to the table with firmly entrenched positions that they are mandated to defend like the Mayor's Council, for example. So citizen engagement can be constructed as a parallel or complementary process to stakeholder engagement, and it aims to include citizens in processes as individuals who represent themselves. Public interest groups sit somewhere in between citizens and stakeholders, and they take public interest perspective. They might be on one side or the other as well. But how does citizen engagement fit with the concept of public involvement? Well, public involvement is an umbrella term 
that generally refers to the spectrum and methods of which how to consult, engage, or involve citizens and stakeholder groups in policy or program development processes. But let's take a look uh, at the whole goings on of the uh, transportation plebiscite vote, uh, and we'll put on our 2020 hindsight glasses. What does all this mean in, in the context of the tra transportation vote? Could the outcomes have been influenced so that a yes vote might have resulted? How might things have turned out? Let's take a look. Let's start with the question that was asked in the first place. The vote asked people if they would approve a half percent sales tax increase, but from the earlier feedback provided to us in the consultation topic, a lot of people didn't seem to have all the information, or they lacked trust, or they didn't feel like they had a say in the outcome. A yes-no vote isn't a consultation when it's the only option that's ever been presented. Maybe a better question to ask citizens would have been, how would you propose paying for improved transportation and transit services? Now this question gets everyone thinking. Everything becomes fair game. Sin taxes, usage taxes and fees, economic stimulus, and so on. Unfortunately, the entire plebiscite was an all or nothing proposition. Vote for a tax increase to improve transportation, period. Well, people responded somewhat predictably by voting no. Not because they weren't necessarily against the idea of improved transportation, but rather because they weren't really a part of the process that arrived at the decision to increase sales tax by half a percent. So, had the people been a part of that process, then the outcomes might have been a little different. The lower mainland of British Columbia has a lot of issues facing it, but rather than having a transportation vote, the province might have had a vote on enabling oil pipelines, or a vote on legalizing and licensing recreational marijuana, or changing the structure of automobile, automobile insurance in the province. Any option might have led to a viable solution that could have increased transportation revenues, and all options could have had potentially hundreds, if not thousands, of citizen ambassadors advocating, advocating on behalf of the province and the mayors. This type of direct democracy is the most powerful approach because it leverages the power of the masses as the media. The people could have, and I would argue they would have, owned the entire process had they been empowered to do just that. I just want to draw your attention to one quote from our media partner. Uh, this was from Bruce Claggett, Senior Managing Editor from News 1130. Um, he's quoted as saying, We were pleased to find PlaySpeak allowed us to venture into a deeper and more meaningful understanding of how people feel about this important vote and issues directly related to specific neighborhoods in the region captured elements of differences across the region and as a result our news reports contain true stories of impact based on geography. And so this I think resonates with the purpose and vision vision and mission of what PlaySpeak attempts to deliver in public consultations. So a quick recap of the presentation. Um, polling is being replaced by online methods as we saw from the first few slides. People are increasingly distrustful of all manners of information collection, but we've, uh, the research does show that authentication and more importantly, geo-authentication potentially increases the perception of security and with that uptake and engagement. And with that, PlaySpeak can be deemed a broker of trust, which subsequently potentially yields better results in public participation. Now, community also plays an important role in direct democracy and engagement, but most importantly, trust. And PlaySpeak is, uh, has been identified as a broker of trust in delivering public participation.
participation and uh, engagement in a community. Public participation also arms proponents with information to ask the right questions to come to uh, a more likely uh, desired outcome. But it's not to be confused with polling. It's about what's happening now and in the future, whereas uh, polling is just about an instance in time. A little bit about PlaySpeak. We began in 2011. We have approximately 60 customers spread out across the globe in Canada, the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia. We are a progressive geosocial network, which means uh, your first consultation will continue to start with one consultation and it'll continue to grow uh, with subsequent consultations and so the audience will grow your efforts to recruit new candidate new participants will uh, will the effort will decrease and the cost required will, uh, will decrease proportionately as well it's a two-side model citizens can connect with government and vice versa or anyone running a public participation we leverage geo-verification of users to facilitate a higher level of authentication and participation in uh, citizen engagement projects. And we also have a number of tools that are being introduced on a regular basis based on our uh, development roadmap. PlaySpeak started out about four years ago with uh, our alpha platform, engaged uh, people locally on from school boards and uh, uh, municipal government since scaled up to larger consultations in various other countries, opened up offices in other countries as well. Uh, we've been focused lately on enabling uh, language uh, localization in different languages and we continue to develop our uh, accessibility features within the platform as well. If anyone has any questions, I would invite you to connect with me directly. Uh, I can be reached at mark at playspeak.com or via directly via my Twitter handle at mpvon or LinkedIn Mark Pivon. And I also invite you to connect to us via our uh, via the Playspeak uh, handles, social media channels. Uh, we can be found on Twitter at Playspeak and on Facebook uh, forward slash Playspeak as well. This concludes today's presentation from PlaySpeak. Uh, we invite you to connect up to the website as well and try us out. Claim your place, speak your mind, and influence the outcome. Thank you very much.